honor and privilege to introduce our keynote speaker, who is a true inspiration, Dr. Subramaniam Swami, an economist. Before Dr. Subramaniam Sami speaks, we'll just give a bit of background. I'm sure he knows no, he needs no introduction, but we'll give him one anyway. He's an economist, senior BJP leader, and his government positions have included Cabinet Minister of Commerce, Law and Justice. He's been a member of parliament for five terms since 1974. He has written numerous books on economics, politics, corruption, and is a passionate fighter for Hinduism. He opened the Gailash Mansrova Hindu pilgrim route from the Chinese and was the first batch to go there. I think, from my point of view, I think one of the most significant things about Dr. Swami is courage, something we need a lot more in our community. It's very rare to see someone hold these positions of responsibility and be able to openly say the things he says, be very comfortable speaking the often uncomfortable truth to the people who need to hear it. And to be able to do it so well, I think Dr. Swami is one of the few public leaders in India who's able to connect to the younger generation so well. I think, I'm fairly sure Dr. Swami has the second largest Twitter following in India. That definitely says something, and I'm sure you'll see why very shortly. I think there are some notable achievements that I'd like to go over that Dr. Swami has achieved in his time in public life. He was one of the few people who openly fighted the emergency. He's one of the very few people who's openly challenged, and in fact, actually legally challenged, Sonia Gandhi more recently. <clears throat> and as an Oxford University alumnus, my personal favorite, he's one of the few people who's actually been banned from speaking at the university. I know, <laughs> I know the hard work it takes to actually be banned from speaking at the university, so I definitely think that's an achievement. <clears throat> So I'd like to now pass it on to Dr. Swami to speak and share his thoughts with us. Dr. Swami. <laughs> uh, I think uh, the speakers here, uh, Dr. Conrad Els, Dr. Gautam Sen, and uh, Rajiv Malhotra, I've covered a very wide ground, so I'll try to bring it into some sharp focus as to why we need to do something. Mark Twain had said that it is easier to mislead people than to convince them that they've been misled. And that applies to Hindus. It's very difficult to tell them that much the history you have learnt is wrong, the truth about our Indian continent, subcontinent is, as portrayed in the history books is wrong. So many aspects where we have accepted them as truth. It's very difficult to convince people that Varna is not birth-based, it's a degeneration, it's an ossification, that has taken place over the last thousand years, that Varna was actually a, a decentralization of power, and it was not based on birth. So there are so many concepts with so much baggage that we have now acquired, and some of it was systematically punched into your head, or you are brainwashed by the educational system. And if you read, the speech of Macaulay in Parliament, it becomes clear that he wanted, as he said, Indian in blood, Indian in color, but Englishman in manners. And so he produced the Babus, as it was called then. So uh, I would say today we have to break through these shackles. And the reason is that essentially the Hindu religion is under siege. It's being hit from all sides, some of it invisible, some of it visible. Take for example, Bangladesh, which we liberated, 
Our Indian soldiers died for it. We were, in 1947, the Hindus were 32% of Bangladesh. Today, it is down to 7%. This, if this had happened in any other country, what if international furor there would have been? They would have called it a gigantic holocaust. 500,000 Kashmiri pundits were driven out from the valley of Kashmir only on the grounds that they were Hindus. And they, many of them still live in, in refugee camps. Not a word about it. And the process is widespread. Terrorist attacks take place in India. They are done by Islamic militants. And the people who die are mostly Hindus. That is, the targeting is done that way. Somebody, some Muslim or a Christian may die by accident or he was in the crossfire. But the targeting is done that way. But nobody can speak about it. They'll have to say, no, these are not, uh, they're not really Muslims. And how are you to judge who's a Muslim, who's not? They have to be disowned by the clerics, then I could believe it. But they have not been disowned. So terrorism is one aspect which is a looming prospect. Why? Because the emergence of something called ISIS. ISIS, well, hopefully if they can be destroyed in Syria and Iraq, well, it will be good for the world. But I don't know, because it's, it is spreading. ISIS units have come up in Pakistan. Pakistan has nuclear weapons. Uh, and if Pakistan is taken over, those nuclear weapons will be used. So, therefore, we have to prepare for that. And for to prepare for that, we have to have a mindset, clear mindset, as to what we need to do. Then you have ourselves all in nagging doubts. See, this nagging doubt seems to have come from the Mahabharata time. When Mahabharata was decided and the battlefield was also decided, Kurukshetra, the armies were all stationed on either side. And Arjuna suddenly develops cold feet and says, how can I kill my own brothers? And it took Lord Krishna to explain why it is his duty to fight and kill his brothers. So this is the, this is the concept of the confusion, which I call as the Arjuna disease. And most Hindus suffer from that. It takes a long time to persuade them that, listen, you are under threat. You have a moral obligation to fight that threat. Otherwise, you will be consumed in it. Uh, but uh, we, at the moment, don't have that uh, ability because of the media conspiracy against us and the, the, the political ideology which was foisted on the India through the Nehru family. Then <clears throat> you can have situations where uh, people will, will not know what they should do. For example, in Ramayan, Sita was kidnapped by Ravan and he put her in his uh, aeroplane or chariot which flies and took her. And she went on uh, screaming, Ram, Ram, Ram. And uh, on top of a hill, uh, Hanuman and Sugriv and three other of his, uh, his brethren were sitting and they were watching her, uh, screaming away and going and throwing her bracelet and a ring and so on, uh, so that she could leave some identification behind. And none of them have felt that they should go and do something about it. In fact, Hanuman could fly in those days. He, of course, Hanuman could always fly. And he could have flown to it and rescued Sita there. But it didn't occur to him that this is his job, that this is his moral duty. It was later when he met Rama that he got convinced. And therefore, uh, he became a different person. So same way today, we, there are so many things going wrong. 
but we don't think that you know we just spectators look at what is happening and that is the core of the things that we need why is why should the hindus unite today because all other major religions are united we were a broad grouping and we allowed ourselves to be divided look at this division between hindus and sikhs it's the most most uh, inexplicable uh, split because the sikh community was founded and then it did the maximum any community can do for another community their uh, great leader kurup tek bahadur took on the mighty uh, aurangzeb the cruel mighty uh, aurangzeb and laid down his life for it for refusing to agree to the conversion of his chelas similarly guru gobind singh he was the one who ultimately defeated the uh, mogal army along with the assam dynasty assam dynasty of ahom in uh, the east so they the mogals were boxed in and thereafter they could not stand up and ultimately they disappeared so uh, why should the hindus and sikhs be fighting there are reasons for it of course there are reasons for it but so what these were we were one part of the same thing we come from the same spring the same river or or, or the same spring from which the river is is flowing the culture of india so we must now make efforts to see how we can bring the groups which have been what shall i say in sync with with hinduism sikhism is a separate independent religion there's no question about it it has its own codes it has its own granth but it is in synchronization its principles are very similar to ours and therefore we have no conflict the same thing and of course their granth speaks so much about rama and krishna and uh, lord uh, lord shiva so much. there is that kind of nexus same thing with the jains and the buddhists we should not allow these groupings or uh, these communities these religious groups to go away from us and since we are the larger community we have to take the necessary step so uh, i think i uh, the first thing we have to do is to recognize the threats that we are facing one is clearly terror and we have to unite to fight and for fighting this we will have to retaliate we can't just uh, every time there's an attack say no no maintain peace these are uh, refrafs who have come we have to take a hard line our government originally started by taking a hard line but there been some uh, uh, some modification maybe because of you uh, i don't know uh, somebody explained some people have got around to explain that uh, the most sophisticated way of doing is is to co-opt them but that's not going to work mufti said is never going to be with you but let's the experiment continue no harm uh, ultimately kashmir can't slip away from us because the army has got total control over it and therefore i'm not seeing that ultimate danger but we see this that in dealing with the difficulties that we face or the threats we face we take a very soft approach take for example the cultural siege that we are in which uh, rajiv malhotra has written extensively almost single handedly on our own we are under a deep cultural siege where all kinds of things have been said which are not scientifically true the aryan dravidian theory where is the foundation for it where is this scientific foundation for it even when it was invented it was all surmises now the dna shows that we are all the same people there is no aryan there is no dravidian in fact the word aryan doesn't exist in any of our scriptures arya exists arya means cultured person it's got nothing to do with race in tamil instead of arya we say ayya so same way dravid is a term which adi shankara invented to describe south india and many people say that's a sandhi of two words tra and vid and uh, the two of them together 
is now being pronounced as Dravid. And for a long time, a movement was started by the British in South India called the Dravida Munnetra Karagam, the Dravida Karagam, who maintained that they were a separate country. They are a different people. And uh, 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 when I once explained to their leader, Shri Karunanidhi, that Dravid is a regional term, he said, no, it is not a regional term. It is our, our, our backward people of, South, of Tamil Nadu. Then I said, well, we have a cricketer, in those days he was the captain, called Rahul Dravid. Do you know what caste he is? He says, well, he, he, he didn't know, so I told him he's a Brahmin. Now, how is a Dravid Brahmin? You have Dravidian uh, uh, movement, why don't you take him as your member? Dravid was uh, come from a family which went from originally from South to Nagpur. And in Maharashtra, you have lots of Dravids. So here you have uh, a clear case where the words have been twisted to make you feel that there's a difference between North and South. They say South Indians are more dark skin than North Indians. Of course, pigmentation is responsible for that. As you get closer to the equator, the sun rays becomes more direct and therefore the pigmentation changes color. And it's got nothing to do with race. Race, we are only one. That is the DNA says so. We didn't come from anywhere. We're indigenous to this soil. Yeah, some little groups may have come, like the Greeks may have come, they may, the Thai people may have come, uh, but they just mingled. They were a very small fraction. The, may, the dominant DNA is one for whether it's Hindu or Muslim or Brahmin or scheduled caste, all one. And it's very difficult for our people to accept this. Because they look at the superficial aspects. And therefore, even linguistics is the same. Every Indian language has, uh, every Indian language has uh, uh, Sanskrit words. Tamil has 42% Sanskrit words. I once counted it in a dictionary and found 42%. Even that I had an argument with Karuna Nidhi. I said, but your name is Sanskrit name, Karuna and Nidhi. How is it Tamil? So, you can find uh, in um, uh, some other languages the proportion is much higher. Kannada, it must be 65%, Malayalam, it must be 75%, in Bengali, it must be maybe 80%. And uh, the Devanagari script, which is used by Sanskrit and also by Marathi and also by Nepali, that script, principle of that script is the same for all our scripts. If you take the Tamil K and you want to write Ki, you just put the Tamil K and put a matra on it, which is the same as the Devanagari principle. It's there in, in the Bengali also. It's there in, in Gujarati also. So there's so much uniting factors which we, we do not know because of, our, uh, because of our lack of knowledge. So this is the first is the first siege we are under is is terror, and that so is a serious threat coming from Pakistan, and aided by Bangladesh, and it's Islamic terror. All the other terrors are localized things which you can take care of, but that's an internationally backed. The problem is that Islam is an international community. Christian is an international community. Hindu is the only community in name. We are all divided in a thousand ways. And look at this. When the BJP came to power, and we still have to find our feet, there was a vote in the UN on the bombing by Israel of Hamas. And the resolution, we supported the resolution condemning Israel. Now that made us, you know, took me by surprise and found that it was just done by officers who said this has been the traditional uh, policy and they continued it. Now, of course, it won't happen again. But the fact of the matter is that why did we do it? Because the Muslims of India would be annoyed if we didn't do it. So where it comes to Muslims being affected, the the attempt by the leaders of the Muslim community, the clerics, is 
to internationalize the thing. In no matter how much, how nice we are to the Arab countries, when the OIC meeting, that is uh, uh, Organization of uh, uh, Islamic Countries, they meet every time they condemn us on Kashmir. Even though large number of temples have been de demolished, the Hindus have been driven out, they, they do not allow Hindus to become uh, residents of Kashmir, none of that will be talked about. They will just say that this is so. And it is based on a concocted history. Where does it say that the, the, uh, the state of Kashmir is disputed? When, India, when the British gave, uh, let go of India, there is a famous uh, parliament session in which the Indian Independence Act was debated and passed. And Stafford Cripps was the one who gave the principal speech, and particularly in the third reading. And what did he say? He said, there is no alternative but to create, create a Hindu country and a Muslim country, because they are two different civilizations. But we didn't create that, because this whole thing was aborted by Jawaharlal Nehru, and then we ended up with a situation where Pakistan treated itself as a purely Muslim country, and we were speaking about secularism, which none of us understood very clearly what it means. So, therefore, the uh, Kashmir at that time became part of India because the Maharaja signed the instrument of accession. The instrument of accession is there in the uh, Indian Independence Act debate of, of uh, British Parliament. And what does it say? That if, because when the British partitioned India, they didn't partition the whole of India and Pakistan as we know it today. They partitioned those portions which they directly administered. And the remaining were kingdoms of, of uh, uh, you know, various rajas. For instance, uh, Kapurthala had a separate country. Uh, so did uh, the Indoor rajas have. Volkars had a separate country. Uh, Hyderabad had a separate country. They all had been declared countries. 600 countries were declared. And if you had seen the map of India, if these are 600 independent countries, it was the most moth-eaten country it could have been. It was the dynamism of Sardar Patel, who, who, <laughs> who met, who actually used the Sanskrit uh, uh, dictum, Sama Dama Bhed Danda. With some he argued, some he persuaded or bribed, uh, then some he created divisions in them, and some he gave them a danda. So, this, uh, this, by this method, out of 600 independent countries, 500 were merged into India. Only 100 went to Pakistan. But the instrument of accession says that the king does not have to take the wishes of the people into account. No need for the king to take into account the wishes of the people or ascertain the wishes of the people. And once he signs, it is irrevocable. The merger is, cannot be reopened. So where is the question of wishes of the people of Kashmir? Even uh, Jawaharlal Nehru did the foolish act of going to the UN. There the uh, uh, United Nations only said conditionally, if Pakistan withdraws its troops from the all of Kashmir, then we can consider the holding of of a plebiscite. But Pakistan has never withdrawn. So that resolution has now become infructuous. And yet, you see, we are, we are allowing ourselves to our country, and people talk loosely about Kashmir is a disputed area. We should sit together with Pakistan and settle this and not go to war. In the end, as Lord Krishna said sometimes, when he proposed that I should join a council of peace, you should say peace and war. Because sometimes <laughs> war is necessary. And we could have taken it in 1971. Pakistan had collapsed. But the pressure of the Soviets was so strong on Indira Gandhi that she abandoned this step. Otherwise, the original idea was that. 
the, after the collapse of Bangladesh and the collapse of the uh, generals and 100,000 Pakistani soldiers came into our prison, they were totally demoralized. And at that time, we could have done it. We'll get another chance, don't worry, because the Pakistan... <laughs> So, in this you find that all kinds of things are told to you not to do what will unite your country. Caste is one thing. Caste is not birth-based. At least Varna is not birth-based. If Varna was birth-based, then Vishwamitra could not have been a Maharishi because you were born in a Kshatriya family. Uh, same thing with the Veda Vyasa. He could not have the, uh, written the Mahabharata because he was, the, he, he was considered a Maharishi who wrote the Mahabharat. But his mother was a fisherwoman. Everybody knows his mother was a fisherwoman. Then uh, Valmiki was born in a Dalit family. Similarly, uh, uh, Kalidasa was a Vanavasi. He was cutting branches of trees uh, to make a living. Till uh, the, there was a trick prayed and when he was married to a princess and that princess then educated him to become the greatest poet, and he became a Maharishi. And if Brahmins were not above the law, Raman was a Brahmin, and he committed a, a, a wrong, so he had to be punished. And he was punished by a Kshatriya, namely Lord Rama. And the Brahmins don't say, look at this Kshatriya, he went and killed one of our Brahmins, we will not worship Rama. No, uh, no Brahmin will say that. So this whole thing, this is one. Similarly, Sanskrit, what is the point? It's a dead language. What do you mean, what's the point? What's a dead language? NASA has just adopted for the most advanced area of computer science, namely artificial intelligence. Sanskrit is compulsory. Without that, you cannot study it. <laughs> and, and in your England, there is a school called St. James School, which teaches Sanskrit. Because they say it generates vibrations by which the mental faculties get sharpened. So, Sanskrit is being adopted by the rest of the world. But for India, it is an old language. Why are you wasting your time? So, if you learn Sanskrit, then all the Indian languages come within your reach. Because the vocabulary is so close. So, therefore, I would say to all Hindus, if you can't learn Sanskrit, make your children learn Sanskrit. Today, the online, the online and, uh, and uh, DVDs, they are such that you can learn Sanskrit within a very short time. <laughs> now, <clears throat> we have another challenge, and that challenge is demographic. We are 80% Hindu, and our percentage is coming down, not very fast. I mean, uh, these alarmists say that, you know, we will not be a minority, not, 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 not for a long time. Uh, we have got enough time to rectify it. So it's a question of uh, the proportion of Hindus coming down. Now, and the proportion of Muslims are going up. Christians are not going up, uh, even after their uh, heroic efforts and conversion. Uh, they are not able to make much dent. So, the question is slowly that there in some time in the future, we would be in a situation where the Hindus will not be in a majority. Kerala, we are very close to losing the majority. We are 53% today. Uh, in, now, what is wrong if uh, Hindus are not in majority? Well, if you want democracy and you want secularism, then you better have Hindu majority because Muslim majority there will be no democracy, there will be no secularism. Tell me one Muslim country in the world which has democracy. People say Malaysia, go and see what's happening in Malaysia. That kind of democracy is like Ayub Khan's democracy, you see. Uh, similarly, uh, Turkey was once upon a time a genuine democracy, but see what's happened there, uh, how things are going. Tunisia is a practical collapsed. The only a uh, country which we can say is approximate to a democracy and a Muslim majority country is Indonesia. But Indonesia is practically Hinduized. Its currency has got Ganapati on it. I don't know whether you have seen this 10,000 rupee no, rupaya note of the uh, uh, Indonesian. It has got Ganapati on it. So I met in a, one of the conferences the finance minister, I asked him, how did you put Ganapati there? 
He said, you see, in 1997, the currency was getting devalued very fast. You know that there was an Asian case. And everywhere, Japanese, everybody's currency was falling. So somebody said, if you put Ganapati's photo, <laughs> it will stop. And we put and it stopped. <laughs> Their airline is called Garuda Airline. And ours is called Air India. <laughs> Most of the time, we have all adopted all these westernized names. And in Thailand, everywhere you see where the Hindu influence is there. And there is a very famous scholar, poet of China called Dr. Hu Shi. In 1936, Harvard invited him to the tricentennial year celebrations. Harvard was 300 years then. So they called all scholars from all over the world. And they called him, he was president of Beijing at that time. And they said, speak on any subject you want. And Harvard has reproduced that in the tricentennial volumes. And his speech was titled, The Indianization of China, a case of peaceful borrowing. Uh, uh, in, uh, a case of peaceful borrowing. And what does he say? Without firing a single bullet, the Hindus had completely won over us and we adopted blindly all their concepts of how, what concepts? How a mother should behave to a son, how a father should behave to his da daughter, how a husband should behave to his wife, all interpersonal relationship, this all, the, we adopted a monkey king also, they have a monkey king in China. So, therefore, uh, all these things explain that the power of ideas which the Hindus had that was the most important thing. We never lifted the gun to go across frontiers. We went all the way to Cambodia. You can still see temples in Vietnam. You can see them in, uh, in most parts of China. You see long, tall s statues of Shiva even there. So, therefore, this is the way we spread. But Islam spread by the sword. And there too, there is a... Uh, uh, publications of, of Al-Qaeda, which says that India is an unfinished chapter of Islamic history. Why? Because, they say, <coughs> we went to, Islam conquered Persia, when the Zoroastrians were ruling it. And 15 years, we converted the whole of Persia into 100% Muslim. Babylon, Mesopotamia, which is now known as Iraq, in 17 years, 100% Muslim. Egypt, 21 years, 100% Muslim. Christians converted Europe in 50 years. But India, 800 years of Muslim rule, 200 years of Christian rule, and you're still 80%. Because the true history is that we kept fighting. Whether it was uh, fighting and losing, fighting and winning, Shivaji won, Rana Pratap lost, Katapaman in Tamil Nadu lost, uh, Rani Chennamba lost, Rani Jhansi lost, but they created an atmosphere and they created a mental outlook uh, that we must continue to fight and they continued to fight. Clement Itley, after he ceased to be Prime Minister, came to give a lecture at Calcutta and there he stayed in the house of the Chief Justice and the Chief Justice asked, you won the war, and you are, you know, victorious. And yet, we never thought that after becoming victorious, you will leave India like this. Was it Mahatma Gandhi's Quit India movement which convinced you that you should not say? So, Atlee said, no, Mahatma Gandhi certainly was a great man. He united the country. He produced a national organization called Congress Party. But we never felt compelled to leave because of him. We had made a mind a decision long years ago. The British had made a decision. The day we are no more confident that the army will listen to us, that day we'll pack up our bags and leave. And this is confirmed by a very ancient book of 1757, which I got uh, by chance, where the Justice uh, there was a David Co Colin, uh, Collins or something like that, who writes as a witness of 
uh, Robert Clive coming to Murshidabad after winning the Battle of Plassey. And he says, five lakh people assembled on either side of the road. And they were throwing rose petals to welcome Robert Clive. And he says, this is an extraordinary sight. Supposing these people, instead of throwing rose petals, had picked up a stone and thrown at Robert Clive, what would have happened to Robert Clive? The day that, uh, that happens, British must pack up their bags and leave. This is in writing. And that's exactly what Atli said, that when the INA came back, it infected the armed forces. The, their patriotism and their stories of valor uh, made the Navy in mutiny. And they, uh, they, they rose in strength. That is the, the power of India. The day we unite, I'm telling you the world will completely change. It'll, the whole focus will change, it'll give up. But I can tell you the experience is that for that, the Hindus must remain in majority, an overwhelming majority. Otherwise, you will not be able to, uh, to confront the forces which are against you today. The answer is not asking women to produce 20 babies. That's crazy. Uh, women have a right to decide how many babies they want. Even if they want zero, that is their right. Uh, but uh, at the same time, the answer lies in a number of measures, uniform civil code, equal application of family planning, uh, and, and let me tell you, if anyone from another religion wants to return after acknowledging that his ancestors were Hindus, he's not wanting to convert, he wants to deconvert. We should make arrangements for them to Return back to the Hindu fold. <laughs> and, uh, but for that, we have to give up this Varna system. Because many people ask me, when I return, what caste will you have? Will I have? So I said, you take any, who knows you're, you know, you're a Brahmin or not. If you say I'm a Brahmin, they will have to accept. No, everybody calls me a Brahmin, but nobody has got any proof that I'm a Brahmin. <laughs> they assume I'm a Brahmin. So I said, they, if you, uh, particularly if you go to be a professor or something like that, you can easily say, oh, why you bother? You just say I'm a Hindu. There is a movement in our uh, Hindu, <laughs> the Arya Samajis, they don't have any caste at all. They, of course, they've gone to the other extreme saying no, uh, no Murti Puja and all that. But uh, at the same time, I think we, we must take a cue from that. This whole uh, Varna system was created as a division of labor, as a decentralization of power. The two rishis got together, one Rishi Brigu, another Rishi Bhardwaj. They sat down and said, what is the social system that's best for us? And the, uh, Brigu said that there are four sources of power. One is... Uh, learning, knowledge. Second is weapons. Third is wealth. Fourth is land. And these should not be, uh, uh, more than one of these should not be with anybody. So if somebody is going for learning, he must not have weapons, he must not have uh, wealth, he must not have land. And the traditional Brahmins and Acharyas used to live most simply. And even today, the Acharyas live so simply. You compare uh, the way Ram, uh, Baba Ramdev dresses with uh, the Pope. Pope has got satin gown, diamond necklace, ruble necklace. His topi is full of uh, jewels. Whereas Baba Ramdev just has done bhagwa, uh, cloth around him. So therefore, and this is, uh, this is demonstrated how many times? Mahatma Gandhi, wore a langoti and he led the nation to, uh, uh, to liberation in the sense that he became the repository of our freedom movement, even if the British got frightened of Subhash Chandra Bose. But ultimately, there was Mahatma Gandhi to take charge and uh, create an order, uh, orderly transfer as much as he could. So, but Americans used to ask me, how is it that you people followed Mahatma Gandhi? He's not properly dressed. 
So I said, your leadership must be properly dressed. He said, of course, they must have the best suit, the best tie, shining shoes. I said, what happens if Mahatma Gandhi comes and says, I'll lead a freedom movement in your country? He said, we'll put him in jail for indecent exposure. <laughs> so that is the American way of looking at it. Ours is never, we have never made wealth as the determination of social status. In fact, the highest was for people with sacrifice and learning. And that, those values are the ones that made us consider the Chinese travelers, whether it's Vasco da Gama or anyone else who came from abroad, who said this is the most honest country we have seen. Because we never venerated money. We never decided our social structure on, on money. And that value is something that, therefore, we must have material progress. But it should be harmonized with spiritual values. And then only you will have a perfect society which is free. Otherwise, there will be greed. More and more materialism means greed. And greed means corruption. Corruption means destruction, ultimately. So these are some of the things that you have to learn. And I would say, therefore, please forget the fact that you are in Britain or elsewhere. Even the British and the Americans are now becoming very clever. The American ambassador to India is an Indian. Now, they haven't put a center white American to, to be ambassador. All these years, they have never sent an Indian. At this time, they sent an Indian. To Sri Lanka also, they have sent a man of Indian origin. And uh, here, your advisor, Amrish Patel, is your advisor to the prime, mini uh, prime minister, very articulate spokesman. And uh, he, uh, uh, he, he's an Indian. Of course, he's a British, uh, uh, British resident. You can be British residents. You can be an American resident. But the Hindu identity should be like for the, every other religious groups, a integrated national community. And you should act as that. And we, we are not against any religion. Uh, there's a uh, eminent uh, uh, Sikh uh, uh, intellectual sitting amongst us who said this secularism, don't, please don't use this word, use uh, plurality. And he said that there's no secularism word in, in our language, there is bahuda. Like bahuda, you know, ekam sat bahuda vadanti. The same way, bahuda means uh, the acceptance of multiplicity and plurality. So we don't uh, say uh, that uh, uh, you know, secularism means we have nothing to do with religion, we are totally neutral, not at all. It's only the acceptance of plurality. You have your way, I have my way, we both live together. So therefore, I think this mental consciousness, this mindset, that has to come. And I'm, with my, my last sentence would be to tell you the most important thing is to develop what is called as a Hindu mindset. And the mindset is demonstrated by two, two incidents, I, can, I mean two examples. People think that you have large numbers, large numbers behind you, you are a very strong person. Now take in a place, there are a thousand goats at one place. And one tiger comes. The goats see it. They are in majority. They have the numbers, but they will run the moment they see the tiger. Why? Because the mind, fear is in its mind. It won't think of surrounding the, the tiger and kicking it till it's dead. Similarly, in a circus, there will be five strong lions, well fed, and a thin, lean ringmaster will walk in. He'll close the door, and then he'll crack the whip and say, Climb up. All these lions will climb up on the bench. Then you say, open your mouth. They'll all open their mouth. Then you put his head in each one of them. And all the people sitting in the circus will clap and cheer. But the question is, why none of these lions bite his head off? Because that's how they've been brought up. They've been brought up uh, in, um, uh, by, to obey. From, they have been kept in captivity and they have been taught to obey from when their time they are cubs. 
And so their mindset is, they don't understand their strength. It's like Anuman, he didn't understand his strength till it was pointed out to him. So the same way, the mindset is important. People used to ask me why Dr. Manmohan Singh as Prime Minister was so afraid of Sonia Gandhi. He is sitting on the chair of the Prime Minister and she is nobody and uh, he couldn't even have sent her to jail. And uh, in fact, if he had asked you something about her, you could have given him the offenses that she has committed and you could have, he could have sent her to jail. I said his name is Manmohan Singh. He is a circus Singh. Singh is the name, uh, Sanskrit name for a lion, you see. And he immediately knows only one thing, how to obey. That was his nature. And he obeyed her. I, I used to ask him also, why are you doing this? He said, no, you see, uh, that is the way I'm built. I'm not like you. Not everybody can be like you. This is what he uh, himself told me. So I think, therefore, you must have what I call as the Virat Mansha. That is the Virat mindset. And that means that you have your self-confidence. You do not listen to all this junk bunk that is being uh, given to you. And you will resolve to defend any attack on the Hindu society. <laughs> and, and wherever it is for which you must organize, that is the new Hindu that has to be created. You may be a good British citizen, but you are an internationally part of a uh, Hindu community. And therefore, it, and you stand for its values which values are now being increasingly accepted in the West. Newsweek some years ago had an article, now we are all Hindus. It's saying that people uh, now are saying that, uh, uh, you know, uh, cremation is now out of date. I mean, cremation is in, in, in and uh, burial is out of date. They are saying that all religions lead to God. Only Hindu religion says that. Christianity doesn't say that. Islam doesn't say that. Only religion which says that. So he said the, these concepts, and uh, they, are, they prefer logic, theology, which we have. We don't have any prophet to tell us what to believe. We have books, and those, some of those books can be even amended. Vedas can't be amended, but certainly Shastras can be amended. So this is the way in which we have built a scientific mind. It's the most scientific religion, and we must own it and stand up for it. That is the message that I would like to give you. Thank you very much. Dr. Subramaniam Swami, thank you very much for your pearls of wisdom. We're honored and humbled to have you here today speaking to us. And thank you for reminding us all that we are Hindus and it's our duty to stick together, unite, and to defend our religion. Thank you very much. Another round of applause for Dr. Subramanian Swami.